Welcome back guys to the next lecture. We're gonna get this one kicked off with a multiple choice question. So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is D. So in the following questions, we're gonna take a look at some of the high yield penile conditions that we could see on exam day. We're gonna look at Peyronie disease, the varicocele, ischemic priapism, SCC, cryptorganism, and testicular torsion. So let's first start by addressing the topic of this question, which is Peyronie disease. Now this is characterized by an abnormal curvature of the penis. This occurs as a result of a fibrous plaque within the tunica albuginea which is the fibrous envelope extending the length of the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. Now, something that many students don't remember is that this could actually occur as a result of repeated intercourse-related traumas. So you'll always want to make sure you listen for that or look for that in your vignette. Now, in addition to the obvious physical finding that we see in this condition, patients can complain of pain. Uh, they may experience significant anxiety as a result of this deformity. Uh, and that could lead to erectile dysfunction, a sort of a performance anxiety issue. Now, don't forget, this is not the same underlying pathophysiology as we would see in a penile fracture, which is kind of a misnomer, of course, because the penis is not a bone. But nonetheless, a penile fracture would occur as a result of significant force and a rupture of the corpora cavernosa. This would be seen as a result of an accident during intercourse, as well as in any scenario where severe trauma could occur such as in an automobile accident, for example. Now, when it comes to repairing Peyronie disease, it's either with surgical repair or a collagenase injection. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, go ahead and hit that pause button. Once you got the right answer, come on back. All right, guys, the correct answer here is A. Some of the most commonly known drug-induced causes of priapism include the use of trazodone, as well as any of the erectile dysfunction drugs like sildenafil. Uh, but there are a handful of drugs that can cause priapism outside of these, including a variety of antidepressants, uh, including bupropion, fluoxetine, or even sertraline, uh, clozapine, which is an antipsychotic, chlorpromazine, which is a psychotropic, prazosin, which is an alpha blocker, and hydroxyzine, which is an anxiety agent. Heparin and warfarin could also cause priapism. Now, if an erection is sustained for longer than four hours, it can cause irreversible damage to the penile tissue. So that's why it is imperative that if it has happened for four hours or more, it's imperative that we fix it. And we can do this with either a corporal aspiration, intracavernosal phenylephrine, that'll um, that will contract the uh, vasculature or surgical decompression. Okay, we could also use ice as a, a first line to try and cause a vasoconstriction, um, but uh, you got to make sure that that's an option on your exam. If it is, you can go with that. Uh, that's more of a step two CK um, type of question, though, so just keep that in mind, though. Um, now, if we don't manage this properly, as I said, it can cause irreversible damage, and that's going to happen in the form of ischemia. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice again. Go ahead, hit that pause button. Once you got this one figured out, come on back. The correct answer here is E. So squamous cell carcinoma of the penis, it's not actually all that common in the U.S., but rather you're going to see it more commonly in places like Asia, uh, Africa, or South America. Now, 30 to 50% of all patients with penile carcinomas will also have HPV. So some additional risk factors you want to keep in mind for penile carcinoma include an HIV infection, exposure to tobacco, having lichen sclerosis, phimosis, history of urinary tract infections, urethral strictures, chronic penile rashes, penile tears, or other penile injuries. Now, a couple known precursors of SCC of the penis include Boanoid papulosis, which is a premalignant focal epidermal dysplasia that's characterized by reddish to brown colored papules that you will see on the genitalia. Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in situ, which is also known as Bowen's disease, is usually going to present as an erythematous, 
well demarcated scaly patch or plaque that's located in sun exposed areas. This could be a, a precursor to squamous cell carcinoma of the penis. All right, on to our next question, multiple choice again. So go ahead and hit that pause button. Once you got it figured out, come on back. Your correct answer here is D. So cryptorganism. This is the term that we use to describe an undescended testicle or undescended testicles. Now, one of the problems that's associated with this is it's going to negatively impact spermatogenesis because a testicle that is in the inguinal canal will be hotter than that optimal temperature for sperm production, which is under 37 degrees Celsius. Remember, earlier in this topic, we talked about Sertoli and Leydig cells, and I mentioned that Leydig cells aren't sensitive to temperatures, but in this instance, this is a good thing because it means that someone with cryptorganism won't actually negatively have negatively impacted testosterone production. However, if the problem is bilateral, then it could lead to a decrease in testosterone production. Now, one of the things you want to watch out for in a vignette is whether someone was born prematurely, because that is a big risk factor. Also remember that if you're asked, cryptorganism is associated with an increased risk of germ cell tumors. Now, hormone levels that you should expect to see in this condition will be a decrease in inhibin B, because remember that the Sertoli cells secrete inhibin B, which then goes on to inhibit FSH. Thus, you'll see an increased FSH. And remember, if the problem is bilateral, then testosterone would likely be lowered, which means LH would also be elevated. Most of the cases of cryptorganism to present will resolve on their own, but if they don't, then we're going to need to perform an orchiopexy before two years of age. All right, next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button if you need some time and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C. Now you're most commonly going to see testicular torsion between 12 and 18 years of age. And this is going to happen when there's rotation of the testes around the spermatic cord and vascular pedicle. Now, this could happen both as a consequence of a traumatic event, or it could just happen spontaneously. Now, this is also associated with a congenital horizontal positioning of the testes. This is known as bell clapper deformity. You always want to look for that in a vignette. That's something that pops up a lot, that, a lot, that horizontal positioning. Now, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that when this happens, patients will be in a ton of pain instantly. That testy will be high riding, and there will be an absence of the cremasteric reflex. Now, this is an emergency situation, and orchiopexy is needed within six hours of onset. Now, before we move on, let's discuss the varicocele. This is very common and therefore highly tested. In fact, this is the most common cause of scrotal enlargement in males. So what's the problem here? Well, as a result of an increase in venous pressure, which I'll explain why in a minute why this happens, there's consequentially going to be dilated veins in the pempiniform plexus. Now, the way this usually presents in the clinic is with someone coming in because they feel a bunch of these thick string-like structures in the scrotum. Now, the typical buzzword you see is that bag of worms. But don't expect them to just throw that at you on exam day. Always look for the description. Now, if you remember earlier when we were talking about the gonadal veins, I mentioned that one side, one side entered into the renal vein, one side enters into the IVC. Now, the side that enters into the renal vein does so at that 90 degree angle. That means that there is more gravity and more backwards pressure. That is why the side that has a higher chance of getting a varicocele is the left side. Okay, make sure you remember that. Now, one of the worrisome consequences of the varicocele is that because there's more blood than surrounding that testy can actually increase the temperature. And we, of course, know that the Sertoli cells are sensitive to increases in temperature. This is why this could be responsible for infertility. Now, diagnosis of this is fairly easy, uh, and you can do it right there in the clinic. But if an ultrasound is done, remember that this does not transilluminate. Okay, treatment is only needed if the patient experiences pain or if they're uh, trying to uh, get pregnant with their partner and it's not happening. So pain or if it's causing infertility. All right, let's move on to the next question. 
Go ahead and hit that pause button if you need more time, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. All right, let's take a look at the benign scrotal lesions, which are testicular masses that can be transilluminated. Now, these will include the congenital hydrocele, the acquired hydrocele, and the spermatocele. Now, although the vergocele, which we just talked about, is similar in that it's the most common cause of scrotal mass, remember that it does not transilluminate, which means on exam day, if they mention transillumination versus non-transillumination, you want to make sure you keep these separate. Okay, so first we have the congenital hydrocele. This is a common cause of scrotal swelling in infants, and this is caused by an incomplete obliteration of the processus vaginalis. Now, this typically resolves itself within a year. Now, one of the ways by which this presents itself is with enlargement of the mass upon standing. However, you will see alleviation of the mass when lying down. We call this a communicating hydrocele. An acquired hydrocele, on the other hand, is non-communicating and is when fluid collects in the scrotal sac secondary to either infection, trauma, or a tumor. If this is accompanied by blood in the scrotum, we can call this a hematocele. Next up is the spermatocele. This is characterized by the presence of a cyst, which is due to either a dilated epididymal duct or a re testes. Now, this is usually filled with cloudy or clear fluid that can contain sperm, thus the name spermatocele. All right, well, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button if you need more time, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, your correct answer here is D. So when it comes to testicular tumors, remember that we've got germ cell tumors, which are going to account for the overwhelming majority of testicular tumors at around 95%, and sex cord stromal tumors, which account for a very small amount of the diagnosed testicular tumors, right around 5%. Now, germ cell tumors are going to arise from germ cells that produce sperm. Sex cord stromal tumors develop from embryonic sex cord derivatives, i.e., the structures that would develop into the Sertoli and Leydig cells. Now, when it comes to each type, the germ cell tumors are usually going to include the seminoma, the embryonal carcinoma, teratoma, yolk sac tumor, and choriocarcinoma, while the non-germ cell tumors are going to include the Leydig cell tumor, Sertoli cell tumor, and primary testicular lymphoma. Now, let's take a look at the different types of testicular tumors. But in order to do that, I first want to do a matching exercise to see how well you actually know this stuff. So do your best, and then after we discuss everything, you can go back and try it again, see how much you improve. So go ahead, hit that pause button, take as much time as you need, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All right, so here are the correct answers. If you guys need to fix anything, hit that pause button and do so. Otherwise, let's dive in and let's start with germ cell tumors. Now, as I mentioned, these account for the vast majority of all testicular tumors. Now, there are some specific risk factors that you really want to keep in mind about this category of testicular tumor, including something we recently discussed, which is cryptorchidism and Klinefelter syndrome. So let's start with the seminoma. The seminoma is a germ cell tumor and is the most common testicular tumor and is malignant. Now, this is going to present with a painless and homogeneous enlargement of the testes. Now, you won't see this in infants. On histology, watch for that classic fried egg appearance. Also look for increased PALP on labs. This tumor has an excellent prognosis because it's late to metastasize and it's very responsive to radiotherapy. Next up, we have the embryonal carcinoma. This is a malignant, painful, hemorrhagic mass with necrosis. Now, it's important to note that you rarely see this on its own. Rather, it's going to be mixed with another type of tumor. So you're going to wanna to pay close attention to the labs here because if the HCG is elevated, but the AFP is normal, that would indicate that we've got a pure embryonal carcinoma. However, if the HCG is elevated and the AFP is elevated, that would indicate that we've got a mixed tumor. All right, now this does not have a great prognosis. Next up is the teratoma. 
Don't forget, this is going to contain tissues that are derived from all three germinal layers. A mature teratoma can be malignant in an adult male, but is going to be benign in children and in females. Now, typically, when we think of mature teratomas, we think of them as benign tumors. So you want to make sure you keep this exception in mind. These usually grow fairly large and are also going to be composed of a cyst or cysts filled with yellow, thick, sebaceous materials. Now, the only hormone abnormality that you might find with a teratoma is a slight increase in AFP, but it could also be normal. So you don't want to count on that too much. Now, the yolk sac tumor is a tumor that is highly malignant and aggressive. Now, this is the most common type of testicular tumor that we're going to see in males under three years of age. So if you get a vignette with a very young boy, I want you to think yolk sac tumor. Now, as with the ovarian type, we can see Schiller Duval bodies that look like glomeruli. Inside this tumor, you're going to find yellow, mucinous fluid. Now, do you remember which elevated lab value is characteristic of this type of tumor? That would be an increased AFP. HCG can be normal or it can be slightly elevated as well, but here you want to focus on looking out for that elevated AFP. The last of the germ cell tumors is the choriocarcinoma. Now, this is characterized by the presence of disordered syncytiotrophoblastic and cytotrophoblastic elements. One of the important notes you want to remember about this tumor is that it can spread through the blood to the brain and the lungs. Another finding unique to the choriocarcinoma is that because HCG is very high in this tumor and because the alpha subunit of HCG is identical to that alpha subunit of LH, FSH, and TSH, patients can present with the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. All right, let's move on to the next topic, which is the non-germ cell tumors. So go ahead and hit that pause button, match the tumor type with its correct feature. Once you got everything, come on back and we will discuss. All right, guys, here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit that pause button and do so. Otherwise, let's turn our attention to the non-germ cell tumors, which are the Leydig cell tumor, Sertoli cell tumor, and primary testicular lymphoma. First is the Leydig cell tumor. Now, this is usually going to be benign, and it contains those unique eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions known as Reinke crystals. Now, because this tumor produces estrogens and androgens, watch for signs and symptoms of precocious puberty, as well as gynecomastia, which don't forget is breast tissue enlargement in males. Now, just a quick review question. Is gynecomastia ever normal? The answer is yes. It can be normal in infants. It can be normal in boys undergoing puberty. And it can also be normal in elderly men. Next up is the Sertoli cell tumor. Now, this is a benign tumor, and it actually makes up less than 1% of all testicular tumors. So because it's so rare, the chances that you'll get a lot of, of this topic on your actual exam is pretty low, but nonetheless, we need to know it. So how does this present? It presents with a painless, slow-growing testicular mass, and it can be associated with a couple conditions, including putz jagger syndrome, androgen insensitivity syndrome, and testicular feminization syndrome. And finally, we have the primary testicular lymphoma, which is an aggressive and malignant testicular tumor is typically a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, when is this going to be common? You're going to find that this is the most common testicular cancer in older men. All right, let's move on to some true or false questions to test our knowledge of non-cancerous male reproductive problems. So I'll give you a few seconds, go ahead and figure out if you think this is true or false, and then come on back. All right, is this true or false? This is false. All right, let's talk about epididymitis. This is, of course, inflammation of the epididymis, and it presents with localized pain and tenderness over the posterior aspect of the testes, as well as pain relief with scrotal elevation. That is known as, the, as a positive PREN sign. Now, remember that in younger males, the most common cause of both epididymitis and orchitis are going to be chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. While in older males, your two most common causes are E. coli, and pseudomonas. All right, let's do the next question. Give you a few seconds. Once you got it, come on back.
This is false. Orchitis is, of course, inflammation of the testes, and this presents with both pain and swelling. Now, this is actually very rare in young males less than 10 years of age. But keep in mind that mumps can cause orchitis. And if someone has mumps or orchitis, remember this increases their risk of infertility. So you always want to be sure to recommend the MMR vaccine so that you can prevent this from happening. Next question, true or false? Go. This is true. Prostatitis is, of course, an inflammation of the prostate gland, and this is going to be characterized by symptoms that are similar to those you'd see in BPH. Now, in older men, an acute bacterial cause of prostatitis will most commonly be E. coli. In young males, though, it's a bit different. Now, do you know what the most common cause would be in a younger male? Of course, chlamydia and gonorrhea. Now, if it's a chronic case of prostatitis, remember that the cause can be both bacterial and non-bacterial, as well, it can be caused by nerve irritation or even chemical irritation. All right, next question. Let's do a bit of a matching exercise. I want you to match the prostatic pathology with its correct features. So there can be more than one correct feature. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Once you got it, come on back and we will discuss. All right, here are the correct answers. If you need some time to fix anything, go ahead and hit that pause button. Otherwise, let's dive in. Let's start with BPH. So of course, BPH is a condition that we know very well. It's very commonly tested. You're gonna see this most commonly in men who are over 50 years of age. And this presents most commonly with urinary related symptoms like frequency, nocturia, difficult starting and stopping the stream, and dysuria. Now, a rectal exam of prostatic hyperplasia is going to reveal a smooth, elastic, firm nodular enlargement of the periurethral lobes. Now this growth will in turn compress the urethra from those lateral sides that will obstruct that flow of urine and that can lead to those characteristic findings. Now the consequences of this condition can lead to distension and hypertrophy of the bladder, it can lead to hydronephrosis and even UTIs. So what you're going to see here is an elevation in total PSA with increased fraction of free PSA. This is made by prostatic epithelium stimulated by androgens. So once we've identified this, what's our treatment plan going to look like? Well, we can relax a smooth muscle by giving our patients an alpha-1 antagonist like terazosin, as well as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Now, what else can we use 5-alpha reductase inhibitors for? Hair loss. We can also use a PDE5 inhibitor if needed. Now, if surgery is warranted, we can do so with a minimally invasive procedure like the transurethral resection of the prostate, that's also known as TERP. All right, let's talk about prostatic adenocarcinoma while we're here on the topic of EPH because this is also going to commonly be seen in men over 50 years of age. Now, while BPH was most likely going to result from hyperplasia of the periurethral lobes, adenocarcinoma of the prostate is most likely to arise from the posterior lobe of the prostate. Increased levels of PSA and biopsy are going to be our two ways to make our diagnosis. Now we can gauge the metastatic potential of the cancer with the Gleason grade, which histologically grades the metastatic potential based on the glandular architecture. And this closely correlates with metastatic potential. Now remember in BPH how I mentioned that there's an increase in total PSA with an increased fraction of free PSA? Well, in this instance here, the total PSA is still ele elevated, but this time we're going to have a decreased fraction of free PSA. You can also use the PAP, which is the prostatic acid phosphatase. We can use that as a marker for prostate cancer. All right, that brings us to the end of this lecture. In our final lecture, we're going to take a look at some of the important reproductive farm you need to know. Keep in mind that in that final lecture, anything that we've already touched on pharmacologically in any of the reproductive lectures, I'm not going to repeat. I'll just be going over, just be going over stuff we haven't seen yet. I'll see you on that next lecture.